This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 339 was recorded on September 1st, 2022. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one stop shop for all green energy investors. ECRI co-founder Lakshman Achuthan returns as this week's feature interview guest. Lak and I will discuss the technical definition of recession, why we're already in one, and why Lak says there's more risk to the downside than upside for equities. We won't have a post-game chart deck this week due to travel schedules, but we'll be back to our regular schedule next week. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, let's jump into this S&P 500. Since the uh, peak in uh, mid-August, we have seen uh, about 400 S&P points, close to 10% of a decline, uh, just really end the month of August. Uh, And it really doesn't seem to be finding any short-term bottom here. Uh, What's your take on the markets? Well, Patrick, stepping back, as I've been saying for months, I don't understand why we had this whole summer rally to start with. I don't think that any of the economic data suggests that there's any reason to uh, expect a recovery here. Uh, It seems like the summer rally is over. We're headed back down. I can't think of a reason that we're not headed to new lower lows. That certainly has been my base case uh, all along. Uh, Whether that happens and how long it takes, we'll see what, what happens. I think it's important to revisit the seasonality of crash years, though, Patrick. You know, most people think of October as the month that they identify with crash years for the stock market. But in reality, it's usually August when the market peaks. Well, we had a peak in August. It's usually September when volatility starts to pick up. Let's see what happens. This sell-off has been, frankly, quite uh, civilized so far. We haven't seen any disorderly selling yet. It's all been very orderly. Let's see what happens in September. Then October is the month you remember. So the stage is actually set pretty well for a significant event this fall. Let's uh, see what happens. All right. Well, let's move on to that dollar index. We got the fresh high, uh, almost hit 110 on an intraday basis here, up 92 cents on the day, 109.60. But uh, we uh, are the currency markets right across the board are moving euros definitively below parity. But uh, fresh lows in the pound sterling, U.S. dollar yens almost at 140. Like the currency markets are just buzzing here. What do you make of all this? Well, another week, another cycle high on the dollar index, and it comes as no surprise for all the reasons that we've been discussing here on Macro Voices for months and months. Uh, Dollar is the reserve currency. It's the cleanest, dirty shirt, and despite all of the problems with the dollar, it's worse in other places, and the euro and the yen are taking a beating right now. So I, I think it's set to continue, and I don't see any reason to expect it not to. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to crude oil because uh, what a uh, pop and drop over the course of last week. It looked like uh, the bulls were ready to give this a go. And then we've given it all back. And here we are at $87, a place where we've been just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, What do you make of all this oil price action and how did those inventory numbers come in? Well, Patrick, as you say, it's been quite the roller coaster of a week. EIA inventory came in with a drawdown of 3.3 million barrels. Now, it was really 6.4 million barrels drawn out of uh, U.S. inventory, but 3.1 million barrels of that came out of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, drawing the Strategic Petroleum Reserve down to its lowest level since 1984. Shame on you, Mr. President. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 523,000 barrels, gasoline drawing drawing down 1.2 million barrels to still its building 111,000 barrels. U.S. production ticking back up 100,000 barrels to 12.1 million barrels, just 100 shy of the uh, cycle high that we had a few weeks ago. Tape action after the inventory data came out was higher at first, but then we've come back down and we're in the middle of an excursion well below the 200-day contract moving average, basically plumbing the same lows that we tested two to three weeks ago. 
is the bottom in for this market? Well, I thought so last week. It's uh, starting to scratch my head now. We'll see what happens. But I think eventually we're going to get to the point where physical market reality wins out over paper market madness, which is what's been causing the sell-off. All right, Eric, uh, let's uh, uh, dig in on gold. I mean, uh, all, almost all assets have been giving back their summer gains, and gold has uh, just been really acting like a cross currency uh, to the US dollar. Here we are back to war, almost at 1700 again, a stone throw from its previous lows, silver already making lower lows. Precious metals uh, certainly are not uh, decoupling from the natural intermarket correlations and just seem to be weakening. Do you think uh, gold has a chance of breaking to a a, a lower low here, or uh, what's your take on this? Oh, I absolutely do, Patrick. I mean, look at the chart. Everything that we see suggests that we just put in a new lower high, and we're probably headed toward a new lower low. We're not there yet, but just looking at the chart, it seems like we're headed that way. And I think it, we really have to acknowledge here that gold, as you say, is acting as uh, inverse to the U.S. dollar and interest rates, nothing more. The function of gold to act as a hedge against currency debasement or to act as a hedge against geopolitical upsets and so forth doesn't seem to be working. So I, I, I'm very disappointed in gold here. I thought we were going to see better performance. All right. Well, let's uh, touch on uh, the 10-year Treasury yield because bonds certainly have not decoupled either. I mean, it really has been U.S. dollar up and every asset class down. And uh, as bonds are uh, declining, we have the uh, 10-year Treasury yield uh, uh, pressing three and a quarter here and uh, just a stone throw away from uh, those June highs. Do you think we can hit uh, fresh new highs on those yields? Well, this market is certainly full of surprises. For the last few weeks, it's felt to me like, okay, I didn't understand why we're not seeing yields press above 3%, but they're not for some reason. Scratch my head. Well, that's funny. Try to figure that one out. And then, of course, you look at the tape this week, and we're back up to where it seemed to me like we should have been two weeks ago. I don't have any explanation for it, Patrick. I don't know where it's headed, but it does seem like the market is struggling to figure out how to interpret the uh, central bank actions and what it all means for where we're headed. Well, this week's feature interview guest is ECRI co-founder Locke Achuthan. Eric, uh, why did we get Locke back on the show this week? Well, Locke is one of our listeners' favorite guests. He's a guy who's been studying recessions and economic cycles for decades. And, you know, this actually came up before President Biden seemingly reinvented the definition uh, of recessions. I had said that the ECRI definition of a recession was two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. I had quite a few listeners write in to correct me and tell me I was wrong about that and suggest that we get locked back. That was before uh, the president said that that was not the definition of a recession. And so it seemed like a good time to get him back, talk about what a recession is, whether we're in one now and where we're headed. Well, Eric's interview with Locke is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. If you invest to bring about a world powered by green energy, you should meet Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy that serves as a one-stop shop for green energy investors in Europe. Respect Energy brings together independent power producers, accredited and institutional investors holding assets in renewables, or undertaking investments in new green energy production, such as wind and solar photovoltaic power plants. More than 600 institutional and accredited investors have already entrusted Respect Energy with the sale of their electricity production, portfolio management, O&M services, EPC, and project development. If you want to invest in green energy in Europe with the help of a trusted partner, contact Respect Energy today and ask for a tailor-made solution. For more information, visit respect.energy. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. 
Joining me now is Lakshman Achuthan, co-founder of the Economic Cycles Research Institute. Lok prepared a slide deck to accompany today's interview. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com. Look for the red button above Locke's picture that says, Looking for the Downloads. Locke, it's great to get you back on the show. Before we dive into the slide deck, I want to start with a super novice topic, because it seems like we need to revisit it, uh, given uh, a lot of politics lately. Let's start with the definition of what a recession is. I actually surprised myself recently, before President Biden changed the definition, so to speak, uh, I had said on the air that the Niebuhr definition, the official uh, National Bureau of Economic Research definition of a recession was two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And uh, I have more aggressive fact checkers than Donald Trump. So I was <laughs> overwhelmed promptly by uh, listeners said, nope, you got it wrong. That's not it. You should get Locke back on the show in order to teach you what a recession really is. And that was before President Biden repeated my mistake. So let's start with uh, recessions. But really, as investors, what are the key things we need to understand about how recessions, uh, what role they play in economic cycles and what they mean to us? Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm really grateful to your listeners and to you for asking the question and, and, and really wanting to understand what a recession is. I certainly find it fascinating. You know, it's, they call it the Achilles heel of the free market oriented economy, which uh, is not a knock on the free market, but it's, it's, a, it's just a, it's a feature of, of uh, kind of the ebb and flow that we have when we allow a free market to run, which is what we're generally trying to do. So a recession, first and foremost, one of the things is uh, it's not a statistic. It's really a process. Uh, and I think that that trips people up. Uh, certainly, it's easier if you could boil it down to a rule of thumb, like uh, two negative quarters of uh, GDP back to back. And that's a decent rule of thumb. It's not a bad one. But it's not a necessary nor a sufficient condition for a recession, defined as this process that a free market goes through, a business cycle. So we're, we're literally talking about a contraction. A recession is a contraction when the level of economic activity falls. And so it's contracting. And when we say economic activity, we have to, we have to define that. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we don't actually have to define it. We know we, we have to remember what it is. My mentor, uh, Jeffrey Moore, his mentor was a man named Wesley Mitchell who defined what a recession is, and he helped set up the NBER. So it's a, it's a pronounced, pervasive, and persistent decline in broad measures of output, employment, income and sales. And so we do have broad national accounts on those four different types of measurements of broad economic activity. So you could think of GDP or industrial production for output, the jobs data, there's lots of different jobs data, uh, non-farm, household, all kinds of different job uh, activity, labor market activity data. Uh, there's broad income and there's very broad sales, much broader than retail sales, uh, aggregate sales data for the economy. And, and um, you know, in retrospect, because these are government data series, in retrospect, after the revisions are done, and those can take many months or even a little longer, uh, when those revisions are done, you could see with some clarity when the peak and the trough and the level of activity occurred uh, on a pronounced, pervasive, and persistent basis. So in the current environment, the the thing that, that I think needs to present itself, which has not presented itself yet for, for a recession to, to kind of be underway, is clear evidence of uh, falling labor market activity. We have some evidence of that, but not clear evidence of that. For example, household uh, has fallen a little bit, but non-farm has not. And 
it won't be a recession unless there is a, a contraction in in jobs. The level of jobs uh, are falling. Same goes for income, sales, and output. So that's broadly speaking what a recession is. That's the target, the business cycle. The Wesley Mitchell had named his book where he outlined this: the business cycle, the problem, and its setting. Uh, and so that's the world, that's the pool we're swimming in. Okay. We're trying to figure, figure out what's going on inside of that environment. And, um, to do that, we track the coincident data that helps define the cycle. And then more importantly, I think for investors and speculators and decision makers is what are the leading indicators doing, which we'll certainly get into the reason recessions can be important for investors or business managers is because of what they do to uh, demand growth primarily, which can impact earnings growth. And the fact that it's pronounced pervasive and persistent, meaning it's it's not just one section of the country or one sector of the country. It, it, it's pervasive, meaning it, it, it's hard to hide from it. There are some kind of non-cyclical, less discretionary areas, but they probably get tagged a little bit too during recessions. And so let me stop there, just having set the table with the, with the definition. Let's move forward to where we stand in economic history right now. You predicted more than six months ago, last time I had you on the show, you predicted a recession was coming. I've predicted a recession was coming. Now, the White House has said this, whatever it is that we have, this is not a recession. Right. Uh, is there, obviously, there's some politics in this, but is there room to say, because you just said a minute ago, we don't really have the confirmation we need in the in the employment data. Is there room to say this is is not a recession or, 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 you know, we, we're not going to have a recession. Is there room to say that or is that just political nonsense? I'll agree with half of what you said and, and disagree with half. Okay. So I'll say there's room to say we're, we're not in a recession. I think that's, that, that seems clear to me that there is uh, room to say that we are not in recession at this moment. The only hesitancy I have on that is that there have been some episodes where, the decline in jobs uh, began uh, after the start of the recession. And this gets a little complicated into recession dating, which is a little bit of an art, more arcane thing. But it, it technically speaking, see, none of these things, again, I, going to the beginning of my comment, recession is, is really a process. It's not a statistic. So it's unlikely that these four things, output, employment, income, and sale, are or sales are all going to decline at the same moment, right? They all declined in June or July, right? You, it, it's vi it, it would be weird if that happened, but they'll generally decline in the vicinity of one another. And we'll have to do some clustering work to figure out like, okay, if one of them peaked four months ago and one of them peaked two months ago, where's the peak, right? You have to get into the innards of, of deciding where the actual peak is. But it's not impossible, and, and we have seen, and particularly, interestingly enough, in the 70s when it was kind of a more uh, inflationary time, uh, there were big swings in inflation, where jobs growth associated with some of those recessions continued into the recession and then, and then started to contract. Uh, so that's my only hesitancy on saying, yeah, it probably it – probably it hasn't begun. But more importantly, I think, than that uh, is what the leading indicators are doing. Because there's um, no ambiguity there. There's a pronounced pervasive and persistent decline in the indicators, and I included some of that in the deck that we'll go through, that are just clearly recessionary. Well, let's go ahead and dive into the slide deck then and take a look at some of the indicators that you follow and what they're telling us about where we stand in the cycle now. Sure. So uh, I'm sharing a deck. This is something I had, I had shared privately uh, a little bit ago and happy to share it publicly now. So on uh, page um, or slide, I believe it is four, we're going to see a chart of our indexes for the overall economy. And 
then you'll you'll see shaded areas on that chart, uh, which will conform to growth rate cycle downturns when the growth of the economy is is decelerating, and the bottom line is a coincident index. It it contains all of those uh, measures of output, employment, uh, income, and sales, and that marks off basically the shaded areas. When the blue line's decelerating, uh, you have a growth rate cycle downturn. When it, it's contracting, you're you're in recession, and when you're in the white areas, you're in an, in an upturn. And oversimplifying, but uh, for decision makers, risk on during the white areas and risk off during the shaded areas. Okay, um, and then we can get into the nuances of that. So. You see the blue line has not gone uh, negative yet. It's being held up partly by uh, employment or mostly by employment. And so you know, that's why I'm saying, yeah, we're probably not in recession at this moment. Now look at the leading indexes. You've got the uh, short leading, the weekly leading, and the long leading there. And um, when you're looking at those, you could see immediately how they – they move in sequence and and particularly i'm drawn to the the transition moments between the shaded and the white areas and so the long leading index peaks well inside the white area and begins moving down that's followed by the weekly leading index which is followed by the short leading index when the long leading index has turned and by here when i'm saying turned i'm meaning I'm using shorthand for internally what we do internally at Equity, which is we're looking at how pronounced, pervasive, and persistent is the decline in that index itself. And we're getting inside of it and comparing it to past cycles and so on and so forth. It's all very objective. If we're convinced that there's a so-called three P's downturn in the long leading index, now we have a prior, we have a prior view that we're receiving the incoming information on the shorter leading indicators uh, with. And in a way, we can kind of jump on those turns a little a little quicker with the prior view. We build our conviction levels with the prior view. And uh, it's pretty evident visually that we're in uh, pronounced pervasive and persistent declines. Uh, you could see that you could start to see that some of the declines in the uh, indicators have not been seen outside of recession, those those forward looking indicators. The long leading index right now, for example, I'll call out something on the chart for you, is the worst it's been since the Great Recession. And and mind you that um, part of the reason it was worse during the Great Recession is, of course, because of Lehman, <laughs> right? I mean, so, so there was this big event that really kind of shocked things even further to the downside. Lehman, of course, did not cause the recession, but it was a feature uh, of, of that story. And um, it remains to be seen if there's any kind of uh, event of some sort, some, some, some big thing that occurs in the current cycle. And uh, the other thing I would call out here on this chart, and we can move on, is that they haven't turned up those forward-looking indicators. So a couple of weeks ago, you know, people may have been thinking like, hey, you know, the FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Am I missing something? Is the market onto something that I don't know about? Is there some soft landing out there that that I need to be worried about? And, um, you know, these indicators were indicating, of course, no, there is no uh, upturn out there, uh, at least not in the, as far as we could see, which is for for a couple of quarters. Let's talk about the timing of recession cycles versus market cycles, because the mistake that would be very easy to make is to look at one of these economic cycle charts and say, okay, recessions are the shaded areas, recessions are bad, it must mean that during the shaded areas, the stock market's going down, and during the clear areas, the stock market's going up. But it doesn't really work that way. It's There's a, a lead lag effect that, that comes into play. So when should we be most concerned? And if we're in a situation like we are now, where clearly these indicators have been selling off for quite a while now, does that mean we're bottoming? Or does that mean that the the nastiness in the market has only just begun? 
You know, first off, I can't make, I don't make market calls. It's not my expertise. I can, I can weigh in from a cyclical risk point of view on the market. So these are all my caveats that I'm throwing out ahead of talking. Okay. <laughs> you know, there are times when uh, the market, I want to call out two times specifically that the market blew through a recession was in 1945 when we were uh, kind of re reorganizing after World War II to peacetime and the market just blew through the recession there. And um, the more interesting one perhaps for, for, for consideration now is the uh, late 20s, 1920s, uh, 26, 27, there was a recession. Of course, that's during the roaring 20s and the market just blew through that recession. So this is a strong relationship between the business cycle, growth rate cycles, more importantly, I think, and uh, the market. But it's not there's, there's no it's not like physics. There's not a hard and fast rule here. Um, if we flip back, if, if if listeners can flip back to the chart on page three, we see some recent history of the S and P against uh, growth rate cycle shading. This is a um, I think a somewhat unique era which we may still be in, we may not be in, I don't know, uh, of QE following the Great Recession. So I'm just going to stipulate or, or assert that prior to the Great Recession, there's virtually a one-to-one -one correspondence between cyclical, pronounced pervasive and persistent declines in the S&P, and those shaded areas, the growth rate cycles. Okay, Post-GFC, in the QE era, what we see is that the persistence part of the decline in S&P is truncated. And so that's what visually I'm calling out uh, in this chart. You have growth rate cycle downturns and then sharp corrections, major corrections associated with growth rate cycle downturns. But the persistence you can see is instead of being a couple quarters, it could be a few weeks and it's over. All right. So now, ostensibly, and, and I honestly don't know, but ostensibly, we are headed into quantitative tightening. Right. So you see the current growth rate cycle downturn. You see the correction, the 24% correction. You know, I'm going to infer that most of that had to do with the rate hike cycle uh, that started in March. And it was, it feels like it was a little less about earnings concerns, but we'll, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know. I'm just kind of guessing that. And then we have that, that bounce that we had for the last couple of months. Uh, and now maybe we're slipping back down uh, below 4,000. I'm not, I haven't seen the latest numbers today. But you could see that by our analysis, until we start forecasting a white shaded area, you know, I would be careful. It's not that you're not engaged in the market, but you, you, you understand which way the wind is blowing is what I would say. And, and if we are indeed, and this is an open question for discussion, I, if we are indeed moving into a QT environment, then the patterns could change from what I'm showing you here. Perhaps we get more to a more, we, we move back to a more persistent decline around growth rate cycle turns. And let me just take a question if you, if you, if you have one there. Okay, Locke, since you asked for the question, I'll hit you with what I think is the most challenging part of all this. The world has changed. We, we live in a world where the Fed and central banks in general play a much bigger role than they used to in markets. Does that invalidate any of the leading indicators that have been reliable in the past or not? And how should we adjust for the fact that, you know, it feels like what's going on here is central banks are really much more in charge of the show than they ever were in the past. At least that's the way it feels to me. Does that change the way we interpret the old data from before it became that way? Great question. Again, I, I love these questions. Because we get to step back a little bit and just be a little bit more thoughtful than than like the you know day to day stuff, and the 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 answer the big answer the important thing there is is the Fed 
and its actions messing with the, the, the framework with the cyclical indicators and in particular, the leading indicators. And, um, we're always asking that question, like, you know, what could mess with the framework? Where does it break? And, um, I'm relieved to tell you that no, it doesn't break. These indicators actually predate in many cases, the fed and there were cycles and there were markets and these relationships, uh, by and large held what happens to the cycle as the structure of the economy has changed, uh, including, uh, the advent of the fed is that the, some of these relationships can change. Like I'm showing you how persistence of, uh, corrections, uh, got truncated in the QE era. The amplitude of the cycle can also change, uh, by and large, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but by and large, uh, the size of some of the economic swings had largely gotten smaller. This is the so-called great moderation of the cycle and maybe even the greater moderation. I think Bernanke talked about that a little bit. Uh, up until, of course, the Great Recession, when you had kind of a Minsky moment where complacency uh, kind of evokes uh, excess risk-taking, which guarantees volatility. <laughs> so the free market uh, you know, has a way of kind of handling different types of manipulations, right, if you were. Uh, in, in the current environment, right, QE could work as a policy. I mean, work, I say that in quotes, could work as a policy when inflation's low. But when inflation's higher, you know, it's not that all these central banks want to tighten. I don't know if it's in their DNA necessarily to be like, yeah, I really want to tighten around the world. But they have to. They're forced to. And, and what's particularly interesting in the current cycle is that they're forced to, even though the indicators or the forward-looking data is so recessionary. And that's a, that's a very toxic combination. So the advent, the interaction, the, the thumb on the scale of the, of the governments and the central banks, in, in our experience, which is about now 100 years of research, right? I, I, I reach back to Wesley Mitchell, who taught Jeffrey Moore, who taught myself and Honor Vaughn and others at ECRI. And what we've learned is that if you're in a free market oriented, dominated economy, so this can apply even for China, okay, then there's a cycle. I mean, it might be inconvenient. You might not want it, right? Whoever's whoever's in power at the moment certainly doesn't want uh, these downturns, right? But that's the nature of the environment within which we are playing. Let's spin this a slightly different way, Locke. Suppose that we were to look at the last 10 years and say, okay, so there's something significant that happened in history here, which is we went from one central bank policy to this basically quantitative easing uh, era where there were several years of quantitative easing. Now we are supposedly about to begin a multi-year era of quantitative tightening. Now, without even getting into whether that's really and truly going to happen, because I think you and I are probably both pretty skeptical it's really going to happen, but let's pretend that it's really and truly going to happen. Is it possible to look at the data and say, okay, if the era of quantitative easing produced a certain set of results, then it should be possible to anticipate an opposite set of results from a period of quantitative tightening. Can we make those conclusions or is the data too complicated in order to draw conclusions like that? I'm with you on the general thrust of it, right? I, I remember... I think it's President Reagan had a great quote. It was, he was like, you know, trust but verify. <laughs> and I love that. Uh, and, and, and so I, I hear something like what you said, and it, I kind of inherently trust it. It sounds like, yeah, it makes sense. But I'd have to verify it. And, and that's where the cycle indicators come in. We can have 
ideas like deflation, inflation eras or QE versus QT eras and what may happen as a result of that to growth or inflation. But then at least for the near future, looking out a few quarters, okay, we we then switch over to our leading indicators as the the um, kind of ruling radar screen that we're going to 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 use to navigate. And so, for example, in the seventies, right? Yeah, we we know that was a big inflationary decade, but it had huge inflation swings from like you know three percent ish to like twelve percent ish or something like that, right? So it was slamming up and down, up and down that vol. And therefore, even though structurally we had this step up in inflation, you had to be able to kind of surf those cycles back and forth where it would it would throttle back and then rev up again. One of the slides that we presented uh, in, in the deck does take a bit of a longer view, touching on the central bank policy and how it interacts with the with the economy. And that's on on page eleven. It's a it's a different slide than I normally show you, and it you know perhaps actually right before we get into that because it's inflation related, which is related to the structural kind of Fed questions anyway. Maybe let's let's look at at page um, page nine real quick. So we just see the inflation gauge because I'm gonna, I'm then going to build on that inflation gauge for you on the inflation gauge. The red line at the top, that's our U.S. future inflation gauge. So that's conceptually, this is just a leading indicator, but it's not a leading indicator of growth. Forget about growth. Forget about growth rate cycles, business cycles, all that stuff. This is like a laser beam on inflation cycles. That is its reason for being. And um, in the fall of 2020, this uh, took off in a three P's upturn, uh, which is about halfway up that big rise that you see on, in the chart. And, um, we made this inflation cycle upturn call in the, in the fall of 2020. Then it peaked out in the, in the earlier part in the spring of 2021, uh, around a 33 year high. This has a few quarters lead over inflation and, um, has been fairly gently, uh, off its peak since then. So cyclically speaking, regardless of all the money that's being poured out fiscally or, or from the banks, cyclically speaking, the, the peak in inflation is probably in. But the problem, of course, is that the, the, the magnitude of inflation is still going to remain high. And again, you can see that visually on this chart. And so the reason that I'm showing you this chart is because, as I said, in the spring of 2020, we had a pronounced, pervasive, and persistent rise in that forward-looking future inflation gauge. And that is critical information for understanding if you're going to get a soft landing or not, (laughs) because now you can relate that information to the Fed. So if you go to the next uh, slide, I'm not sure if it's 10 or 11, but it's the one with all the dots on it. Okay. And this basically tells you if a soft landing uh, is going to come to pass. I I know there's, I think there's a ton, people talk about soft landings and they're just kind of shooting from the hip. I think this, I think that it's very subjective. I think, uh, as to if there's going to be a soft landing. So our research addresses the question in a much more systematic way, which I'm presenting here. And the, and the conclusion is that the Fed must hike preemptively when underlying inflation pressures are rising. And so that's really the secret of a soft landing. So when inflation pressures are in a cyclical upturn, and I, I've, I've, I've pegged that uh, in the current cycle as the fall of 2020, the Fed has to nip it in the bud then, okay? They need to do it right then. And so you see these vertical gray lines in this chart. And if the Fed starts to hike before, um, to the left of those vertical gray lines, you end up in, with a good chance of engineering a soft landing. 
And so you saw that in 83-84. That's Volcker uh, helped generate a soft landing there. And you saw that in 94-95 when Greenspan preemptively uh, raised and then and then lowered rates. Now, if you can find, if, if, if listeners can find the yellow dots <laughs> on these charts, okay, that's March of 2020. That's the current cycle. And that's really far away from that vertical gray line. Everything to the right of the gray line is a hard landing outcome on a rate hike cycle from the Fed. And so we are squarely in in hard landing territory and they are just way behind the curve. And that's where you have whatever we had happen last week, where they're saying, look, we still we still are, are not fooling around. We still have to have to keep it tight. Locke, you talk to clients all the time about who translate these economic outlooks into market outlooks. Let's talk a little bit about this environment. We're in the 3970s on the S&P as we're speaking right now on Tuesday. Uh, a lot of people are looking at this chart saying, boy, the market was selling off hard into the middle of June. We saw a great big rally, and it's looking more and more like that has rolled over. We're, we're at a point where it doesn't seem like it's set to uh, continue any further, and maybe we're at the beginning of the next really big leg down. Is that the way to look at this stock market, or is there room to say, you know, maybe the recovery's already begun? I would lean towards the former because the forward looking data uh, is not even starting to really bottom out. And uh, therefore, the prospect of going from like one of these shaded areas of downturns towards a shaded area uh, or white area of upturns is is extremely low. But it's just not on, it's not in sight yet. Now, the good news is we can only see a couple of quarters ahead, two or three quarters ahead, right? So it, it doesn't mean this is indefinite, but it does say I would I would certainly be keeping some powder dry for now. Another way of of thinking about this is that if we're right, right, and there and there, and there's a recession uh, uh, in front of us, um, and we haven't even gotten to the global aspect of this, but it is a global recession. Then um, you can ask yourself the question: Has the market priced in declining earnings? Like to what degree? And I know X energy, there has been some kind of come down in earnings expectations, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to really reflect kind of the recessionary outlook as far as I can tell. And so that's a, that, that makes me lean towards uh, staying with the, the, the kind of risk off view in terms of uh, in terms of these different assets. And so you could see that there's, there's a slide in there on junk, or, or whatever you call it, high yield uh, stuff and and crypto stuff, and and those will be great places to go uh, when we get some objective evidence of uh, a cycle bottoming, and, and we just don't have that now. And that combination of the global indicators looking so weak—that's in one of the charts—and I just want to say this slowly, the largest proportion of central banks tightening around the world in history, okay? That's a very difficult combination. And because because remember, uh, policy, you know, the, the interest rate, the policy moves work with long and variable lags on the economy, right? The market may try to react to it quicker, but in terms of all those loans and all the resets and all the prospecting for business and deals, all of that stuff takes time to propagate through the economy. So these rate hikes still are going to be weighing on growth, even though the leading indicators are recessionary. So, Locke, it sounds overall like if I were to tell you that my interpretation of the S&P chart is we've probably seen the, the top of the bear market rally. And just like happened in 2008, another summer when uh, markets rallied pretty nicely, all until it really got ugly. It looks to me like the about to get ugly 
could really be coming. It sounds like there's nothing that you have to say which uh, counters that or says, no, no, it's it's really looking great. No, yeah, I, I'm yeah. with you. I'm with you. I'm smiling uh, to myself because I was, on the one hand, I know Warren Buffett's in the news. It's his birthday and happy birthday to him. He, he uh, I, I think it was in 08 and maybe it was in the fall of 08. And he was like, you know, I love America. I'm buying America and all this. He was doing those those stories. And there was another leg down. And now if you, if you have the wherewithal to, to, uh, take a position and hold it for a year, you know, yeah, we're going to survive this recession and, uh, come out the other side and, and, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and all of that, you know, it is cathartic, but the leading indicators were not turning up in the fall of 08, right? They were still going, going down a bit. And, and we did get the recovery call. Okay, in in March of '09, we had a growth rate cycle upturn call. In April of '09, we had a business cycle upturn call, and uh, of course, the recession ended later that year. Mind you, when there is an upturn call, the markets are going to go risk on in a big way, right? And and um, we're not market timing, but in risk management, right? The payoff for taking on risk in a, when there's a cyclical upturn is much greater in the sense that you, the downside gets cut off. And and so, since I'm not Buffett, <laughs> I'm, uh, that's how I'm, I'm approaching it. Well, Locke, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, please tell our listeners a little bit more about what you do at ECRI, uh, what products are on offer there, and how they can find out more about your work. Yeah, sure. Well... Thank you, and thanks for the time today. Uh, you know, ECRI, we've, we've done a lot of different things over the years. We're, we're focused very much on partnering with clients uh, to manage cycle risk, um, including, as I was just saying, when to embrace it again. And, you know, so we'll be with investment managers, uh, you know, sovereign funds, pensions, hedge funds, and big companies like, you know, a semiconductor company like Taiwan Semiconductor or or, or a a consumer company, a discretionary spend like Disney. And um, they use the information to do tactical stuff in their management, right? So you might have some mandate to to be invested a certain way, um, but to the extent you have discretion, you can tilt with the cycle on managing risk. And certainly with businesses, if you see a downturn, you try to sell your product forward as best as you can, and then you and then you button up and, and and ride out the storm. And if you do that better uh, than your peers, then then you can maybe buy them later on, you know. And that that's basically what we do. And then rinse and repeat. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this. After being completely sold out of advertising space for the last couple of years, we finally have capacity to add a new advertiser. Macro Voices has a PodTrack certified global audience of over 170,000 listeners, and each weekly episode typically gets 60,000 to 80,000 downloads. We have more than 20,000 accredited investors who have registered with us as accredited, and we estimate the total accredited investor audience as at least 40,000 accredited listeners, which we believe to be the highest number of accredited investor listeners of any podcast on the Internet. We strive to accept tasteful advertising from advertisers whose product is likely to appeal to our audience. So we're looking for another investment or financial services advertiser to fill the space I'm speaking in right now. Mail order Viagra salesmen need not apply. If your company wants to advertise on Macro Voices, please email sponsorship at macrovoices.com for more information. Now let's get right back to the show. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have uh, Locke back on the show. 
uh, you know, it, it really does resonate with my current stance, the idea that, uh, you know, questioning whether or not the market really has fully priced in a uh, economic slowdown and an earnings cycle downturn. And, uh, you know, the stock markets are weakening here. We're at some very vulnerable moments where, I mean, if we start legitimately staying on a sustained basis below 4,000 and and we give out 3,900, which is a, a, a level around a key Fibonacci zone, it really does put in play not only a, a full retest of the S&P 500 down to its previous lows, but uh, just like when we had Darius Dale and others come on the show talking about, you know, 3,000 and less on the S&P, they all become uh, realistic downside targets uh, if uh, if things really start to accelerate here. You know, we have the VIX uh, uh, above 25. We have uh, high yield bonds breaking right back down to their lows, like, you know, red flags waving everywhere. Uh, what's your take on all of it? Well, Patrick, we're at a very critical time right now. And I think from a seasonality perspective, it's going to be very, very important to watch the markets carefully in the next few weeks. The week after Labor Day in the United States, uh, that's next week, is traditionally one of the most important weeks of the year in terms of the market setting a direction as far as where it's going to go next. All the big wigs and the trading desks are back from the Hamptons and you know we kind of find out what the direction of the market is going to be. It seems to me, Patrick, like all the economic data lines up to set us up for what could be an outright crash year. So uh, I I don't know where this is headed. I don't know if the Fed is going to blink, but it seems to me that the Fed has to continue to fight inflation. They have to not pivot the way everybody's expecting them to. That disappointment probably leads to, at some point, some disorderly selling, and things get pretty ugly. So I, I think that the risk is definitely more to the downside than the upside. And I'd say the big thing that surprises me about this market that I really don't understand is why it has been so darn civilized. I mean, it's it's really been very orderly. We haven't seen panic selling yet. It's been a consistent grind lower. At some point before this is over, I think we're going to see the panic selling and it could be quite a panic. But on that note, Patrick, we're going to leave it there for today's show. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Respect Energy, a leading European trader of renewable energy and a one-stop shop for all green energy investors. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. In this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to Locke's chart slide deck and a number of uh, links to articles that we found interesting. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account, at MacroVoices, for all the most recent updates and releases. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.